Hi everybody and welcome back to Sit and Knit for a Bit Spring Edition with Arne and Carlos. And we are as always your hosts Arne and Carlos. We've done this uh, spring podcast daily now since uh, March 17th so we've done it for eight days. We are getting closer to the end of the podcast. It's going to be a 12 day um, occurrence. So we are today uh, on day number nine. Yeah. Today is Thursday. Uh, March 25th yeah, so and big day for travel yeah today marks the big exodus uh, from the cities and this is the day when people usually get in their cars and drive up to the mountains to to start their Easter holiday and um, it is probably the one day in the year when there's most traffic out mm -hmm. on the roads it's not the day we would uh, not like to go get on the road to drive. And we're not going to go shopping today. It's definitely not the day to go to the supermarket either. <laughs> it's crowded. Uh, it's going to be really crowded. And in these COVID times, we don't want that now, no. do we? Um, yeah, and people are coming up to, you know, spend time in their cabins, in their mountain uh, retreats. Um, and this is something, or if you don't have a cabin in the mountains, you may have one down by the coast mm. or, in, you know, in a forest or or near a fjord, so people will also be going to those areas um, to spend uh, holidays. And this is something many, many people do, aren't yeah, they? Yeah, a lot know, of people have cabins in Norway. Do you know how many cabins uh, there are no, in Norway? No. Um, there are approximately 440,000 yeah. of them. And it may not sound like a lot, but if you think about it, um, there, we are um, over 5 million in population, but we're not 6 million yet. No. Um, and if you think of an average Norwegian family of four people, so you divide that, you know, that 5 million in, in, <laughs> with four, and then you start seeing that 440,000 cabins is a lot. It means that this is very deeply rooted um, yeah. in, in, in our culture and a lot of families, not all, but many, many families in Norway, they have a secondary home, yeah. which is very exciting. Yeah. Or lovely, yeah. anyway. It's nice. I think people like to get back to their, like, to the real thing, like, yeah. have it, like, old-fashioned. At least they did in the old days. Now, a lot of the cabins are very modern. They are, but so, and at the same time, I think that I think that Norway is divided in two. So you've yeah. got the the you've, hardcore. The, you've got the really simple, basic uh, cabins that yeah. are just you know, <laughs> creature comforts are not really the most important thing. Yeah. It's the to be close to nature. That's what matters. And then you have the very elaborate, uh, expensive, um, luxury. Uh, places which yeah. have uh, you know they have cables down on the on the driveway yeah. to keep running the ice. water they have apps that they can actually turn on the, the gas fireplace as they're driving up um, and and they have like six bathrooms and yeah. saunas yeah. and steam rooms so you have that as well but I think that most families they would that you know most people in Norway they wouldn't acknowledge it. I think they would say that if you have a, a very luxurious cabin with 12 bathrooms and a steam room and room for a pony, <laughs> yeah. right? No, not, not, in, not on the hit. <laughs> no, that, that, that is cheating. <laughs> and cheating. even if they do have it, they wouldn't admit it. No. I don't think they would. Well, like when I grew up, we, had, we didn't have like a hut in that sense. We had like two out farms. Yeah. And one of the out farms were just one house that was used both summer and winter, mm -hmm. and on the other farm there were two houses. One was for summer use, it's called Elhus. Yes. And then the other one was for winter, it's called Winterstue. Yeah. And that Winterstue was more like a cabin. Mm. And we went up there, not not the old out farm, because that was so far away from the farm, but we went to the closest one for mm. Easter and winter holidays. So, so that was kind of, that was like our hütte. Yeah, but it wasn't the hit. It so it's interesting you mention this. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, a few Norwegian words today. Uh, hitte, hit. <coughs> sorry, <coughs> hitte. H y t t e is um, is cabin in Norwegian, yeah. and it is what most people have, whether it's on the lake or by the coast or in the mountains. It's a hitte. And then Arne is talking about the out farm, which is a sater. Mm. Or a stöl, depending yeah. on where you come from. Different names in Norway. In place. Um, and also, you can also. Uh, I think you could include the rurbu in that as well, because it's a seasonal place. Yeah. It's not. It's not a place. A rurbu is a fisherman's hut. Yeah. We also have that where I come from. Small cottages next to yeah. lakes. And so you could fiskebu. Yeah, and you can actually you can actually group those with the sata in a way because they are seasonal. You don't actually go there. Uh, other than to work at a certain time of the year. Anyway, Arne, there's history here yeah. to be told, and it's very interesting. 
um, the history of the Norwegian hytte, which is very deeply rooted in the Norwegian um, culture. Um, so if you look back in time, like mm -hmm. 17th, 18th century, only the old upper class, only the rich people would have had a place to yeah. retreat to. Um, if you were a farmer. Well, if you were a farmer, absolutely. And that is, that is the most uh, interesting aspect of the whole thing, mm -hmm. because um, Norway at the time was a rural society. Yeah. If you look at the 19th century, it wasn't, it wasn't very industrialized here. No. It was all about the farms and the communities living. And then you had also a working class in the cities. Mm -hmm. Now, the working class in the cities, we're not going to talk about them for a little while in, in my historical recap. <laughs> uh, but they will be discussed a little bit later. But to start with, um, most farms in Norway have um, an out farm or two or three, depending on <laughs> how you know, big the farm is, and these are called satter, and, and you were already explaining, how many did you, do you, you, yeah, have, you two, guys have two? Two, but that's not normal where I come from, normal is one, but like in this area it's normal to have two, yeah. I think, so it's different, also in different areas. And what do you do with those art farms, when do you use them and why? We moved up there around midsummer, then we took all the cattle and we just moved the whole thing with my grandparents, mm -hmm. and we stayed there until this. The, uh, until the autumn came, so late yeah. autumn, we had, the kids had to go down for school and then my grandparents kept, kept on staying. So they were like look, taking care of the cattle, they were milking. And then my, my parents were down in the valley on the, Working on the, farm, the real yeah. farm. So what was the reason? Why do they do that? Why, why do people have the out farm? What, because what you can't for? use the soil in the, in, down on the farm for, mm. for um, pastures yeah so that's why you go move up to the mountains so the cattle can run free and you have a lot yeah. of pasture all over the mountains yeah so, so you would kind of a holiday for the cows so you'd be <laughs> surprised uh, I mean if we say that um, he, even here where we are up on top of a mountain if we're driving in the middle of the summer there might you know there might be a cow lying on the road yeah. right I mean or that happens sheeps. all the time or sheep a lot of sheep. <clears throat> they roam freely around here and um, yeah and sometimes we have to stop the car and and wait for the cows to kind of cross the street or the <laughs> yeah. road or or maybe the sheep are lying you know and the they sheep love, doesn't move they so love the asphalt they, they love, love the, heat the asphalt, the asphalt. It's warm yeah so. so so this is something you would see still today um, being done so you you bring the the cattle the sheep yeah. to the mountains and you let them roam free for the summer and then you gather them up right they all have marks on their ears yeah. mm. so you know who which cow because, or which sheep because the, the, the sheep run free and the yeah. cattle they are normally connected to a farm yeah. out farm so. and running over a sheep or a cow here in Norway is a big no-no and if you do <laughs> you have to oh, it's very expensive <laughs> yeah. right and you have to check the number <clears throat> on the air yeah. and call someone uh -oh, yeah uh -oh. but we've never had that no luckily us. But your sister does, she keeps running over... Uh, but that's more like those <laughs> deers. Yes. I don't know if she, she ran into three deers in one winter. Yeah. I don't know why, but the small ones, they just jump on her car. Yeah. She had this allure. 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 She allure, has the allure. Allure, allure, yeah. allure when it comes to deers. <laughs> yeah. They're just... If she's on the road, they know. <laughs> anyway, we're digressing again. Yeah, yeah, okay. okay, back to history. <laughs> so Norway was a rural society, which meant that the majority of the people in Norway in the 19th century was, were working the lands, so or they were fishermen. You know, they had these kind of jobs. Yeah. And if you had a farm, you had an out farm, or a rurbu in, in, in the north of Norway where they fish, the rurbu would have been a seasonal place for fishermen to come for the season and they would stay there and they would fish mm -hmm. and then once that was done they would leave right so you have this you have this uh, this situation where you have a very big uh, part of the Norwegian population where they're moving they're mm -hmm. moving from uh, their main place where they live to a place where they spend some time yeah. in the season right and they're doing this and they're connecting with nature and this gives a very special relationship for Norwegians uh, with nature, so mm. the whole idea of of being able to leave your your main workplace and then go up into the mountains with the cows and then spend a summer there with maybe a, living a very simple life but very close to nature, yeah. the beautiful light, right? Yeah. And and then and then I mean um, I, I I I love your story. So you have stories about when you started knitting and how much you could knit 
before you got the milking machine mm. and then you had a, your whole industrial revolution happening in, to you right when it came to knitting and that was late that was like in the 1990s so what happened <laughs> you were you were milking by hand and then you didn't have time to knit yeah, because and then like, the milking machine came yeah right? we got this aggregate yeah and then we could have a milking machine a generator for generator yeah. so then I could put the milking machine on the cows and then I had like this little stool in the, in the middle of the barn yeah. where the cows were and I was mil uh, knitting while the milking machine so was doing So instead this. of doing this, you were doing this? I was doing this. So that was your own industrial revolution in the 1990s? Yeah. That was kind of... It was kind of nice in a way but it was very no noisy compared mm -hmm. to when I was milking by hand but yeah. That was hard actually when you wake up that early in the morning and you had to milk you almost fell asleep on the yeah. cow while you were milking so you're saying but, you're saying something else you're saying that you had a generator in the 90s you didn't have one before and actually that's the whole point so to to go up to the out farms in the old days was very simple life was very simple you had an outhouse mm. you had to heat up your water to wash yourself um, and to clean and, and also for the animals you have to yeah, take yeah. care of them to everything get really early to, to, yeah. to get the oven warm exactly <laughs> so very very simple life and that kind of has stayed with us in I our prefer that actually in our brain yeah actually it is more um, quaint for a, and for more a rustic. cabin I like that like yeah. my brother now they, they have like this uh, panel this sun thing what's that yeah, solar panel solar panel so now like you can watch TV and you can listen to radio and stuff that wasn't the yeah no we did i didn't have that i remember one year i had a tv like mm -hmm. this little travel tv and i had a battery for the oh, car yeah, yeah. and i could put that on and, and one summer there was something special in the air i think it was especially warm or something so actually i had really bad contact yeah i could hardly see the norwegian tv but one summer i had russian and italian tv oh boy wow cool totally clear i could see everything and hear everything very cool that was nice there was something in the air i guess <laughs> yeah i don't know probably but anyway <laughs> let's get back to history so so this is the beginning of uh, the relationship between norwegians and their hit their their cabins so um now we fast forward to the 20th century let's go to a period between the two wars so uh, and then the, everybody goes, yeah the okay. period between world war one and world war two is kind of crucial in norway this is the beginning of the welfare state as we call here mm. uh, in Scandinavia. What happened between those two wars? People got paid vacations. Was yes. that when that started? Exactly. Yeah. That is when uh, people started to get a paid vacation as their right. And then there more cabins came. Yeah, well, originally, Arne, originally, uh, you know, they would have probably not got, right now in Norway, uh, we have a right to five weeks paid vacation and uh, it is considered uh, necessary for us to take those five weeks so you, you don't really say no to your vacation because the general consensus in Norway is that uh, a happy population is a more productive population. But those five weeks doesn't include Easter holidays and no, Christmas. No, no. No, those are re called red days. So yeah, those so are <laughs> additional holidays. Uh, anyway, five weeks of vacation paid in Norway is the standard today. Between the two wars, so in the in the twenties and the you know, up to the mid thirties, it wouldn't have been five weeks. But no. say they got ten days paid mm -hmm. vacation, and it was a law. It became a law. Everybody had to have that, right? Mm -hmm. And then as 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 uh, as time passes, I mean going after the war obviously because the war world war two were very frugal periods yeah. but after world war two when uh, when people become um, uh, well when things start going well again financially uh, those 10 days would become two weeks and then those two weeks you know and it continued to kind of increase up until the point where it's five weeks paid vacation right so that would have happened um, after the war and you know throughout the years uh, progressively getting more and more yeah. and more paid vacation so so you have a situation after the war when Norwegians actually have time uh, yeah. and they can afford it yeah. uh, what happens in the 50s is interesting as well we've already talked about it in the in the knitting point of view right mm -hmm. um, the golden age of the Norwegian ski sweater and all these big uh, Olympic stars that are becoming you know like really big celebrities and influencing the whole po you know the whole idea that Norwegians are born with skis on their feet <laughs> And yeah, but that's true. Yeah. 
It's, it's hard for the mother, but yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oops, oops. Yeah, oh, the ski came first. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, okay. first and then the skis. It it it, it is the, it is a, a way of life here. Yeah. So the the whole cabin idea fits really well, yeah. um, but in the fifties people would still not have been able to afford the cabin. No. So they'd go maybe to a hotel. hotel. Hotels. Or they rent yeah. maybe a little a little shed or or something in the beginning. Yeah. That's a, we had like when I grew up the neighbor farm that was actually like a hotel or a pensionat. What's that? Yeah, like a, um, a pensione in, yeah. uh, in it, Italian. It's yeah. like a little um, a board. You know, you kind of get a, you pay for a room and you have to share a bathroom and you have yeah. maybe three people staying like in a family. That was kind of nice because they had like. A lot of eccentric people who came mm. and stayed there during Easter and yeah, Christmas. Sounds, sounds great. It was cool. My grandmother was working there. She worked in the kitchen and mm. in the rooms. She was cleaning the rooms, cleaning the rooms and the beds. stuff. Yeah, and making the beds and Moose doing moves. the food. And <laughs> it, was, it was really cool. And and this this same like with this area that we talked about. It was kind of this mm. ski resort area also. And yeah, it's it's nice. But I have to say I prefer if. If we, when you talk about cottages, I prefer the old one. We had the out yeah. house. And so those cottages, are, those cottages, they started popping up everywhere in Norway in the 60s. Yeah. Um, they became more affordable as well. People uh, in the 60s already had more paid vacation. And because of the, you know, Norway was prospering uh, at the time. Uh, in the 1960s, also people became uh, more and more uh, financially independent we will put it that way or they became they were able to afford uh, so there's a word in or in norway called a hytteboom 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 so a cabin <laughs> boom yeah. and um, and they popped up all over the country starting in the in the early 1960s and continuing towards the late 1960s you know, this was actually a problem for us who was farming because when we had the cattle on the out farm there was like cottages popping up everywhere around the out farm and the the people in the cottages they were not so fond of that the cows because no, the cows they, were... they came too close to their houses and they did mm. their business like on yeah. their front porch and so there was like a fight between the farmers with the cattle and, yeah. the, and the cottage people yeah so it's strange it is yeah <laughs> and then people from the cities as well i said we were going to mention the working classes as well the working classes in norway uh, for example, say in Oslo, the workers, they would they would get their own little cabins down at the Oslo Fjord. There's a lot of little island there. So at the same time as there's loads of cabins popping up in the mountains, mm. there's also loads of cabins popping up in the little in the little cute islands. Um, in, back in those days, they were uh, they were for the working class. Nowadays, uh, to afford a cabin there is uh, you re you That's you have to be pretty rich. Expensive. Those are uh, those have become very very sought after and very expensive. I think a cabin even up here where we live are more expensive than the house you will live in. Yeah. Oh, definitely, definitely. So, so anyway, there's a cabin boom and uh, and people spend uh, more time. Now there's a, a few things that are very important to to uh, explain as well. Uh, a Norwegian wants to drive around two hours mm. to get to his cabin. Two to three hours is kind of uh, acceptable. Yeah. And the cabin has to be isolated. It has to be close to nature. Uh, pretty much open the door and have all of your nature around you. Yeah. Very important. That's, that's like if you, if you think the traditional way. Because if you go up here, you can live in a small cabin village. So. Well, yeah, but I'm talking about the 60s and the 70s oh, yeah, then, now. Then it was nothing around yeah and uh, <laughs> interior design very simple uh, you know simple wooden furniture you even have a a very you know hit the steel a style that is very <laughs> typical yeah. which is from the 50s 60s That's like the unpainted wood with a little bit of wood carving maybe and, yeah and the fabric is like very Rough, rough yeah woven yeah and very simple you don't have you're not supposed to have too many things in your cabin just the necessary things yeah. there's always always a little ch uh, shelf for board games and and things like that yeah. right yeah. and you've got your your old knitwear that probably went down you know from generation to generation and you need a fireplace <clears throat> a little fireplace and those uh, is it called buck beds no you know bunk beds yeah, yeah bunk beds because and you should stuff a lot of people in there and usually you have an outhouse uh, as well. That, yeah. You do, an, you have an outhouse because you're not 
supposed to have any creature comforts in your cabin. And some of these outhouses are really cute. Uh, yeah. They have like, some of them have three to three halls next to each other for the whole family. The whole family. We'll so talk about can, these in another episode because yeah, they're quite fun. That's um, fun. But yeah, outhouses are very necessary. Yeah. Uh, and then and basically the, the cabin goes from, you know, from generation to generation and it kind of stays the same. Just as the vintage knitwear that remains, yeah. it remains that way. And I would say that that is the ideal dream of a hytte in Norway. Yeah. And I think that a lot of people still live by that dream. Yeah. I think some people, they really want to have that because yeah. they want it simple. But then all the other one, the newer one, yeah. which are so modern, like now when people have need to have offices at home, some people actually yeah. move to the cottage because they have internet, they have everything. Yeah, nowadays, uh, yeah, there's a lot, like there's li little villages in the mountains which are only consisting of ca cabins and they have yeah. all the creature comforts we talked about. Uh, and uh, But a lot of people will say that is cheating, but it is a hit nonetheless yeah. and uh, people do go to their to their secondary homes and that's where people love spending Easter yeah. uh, especially but a lot of people will also spend their Christmas in, your, in the yeah. Hitte and then they'll take their holidays in the summer as well in the Hitte uh, doing different kinds of activities um, Easter is going to be definitely skiing um, mm. Christmas is also a little skiing Ski. but uh, it's colder in Christmas yeah. so people stand, tend to spend more time indoors and then summer you go out uh, and you pick berries. That's a yeah, very that's big a typical thing. Pick berries, and then in the fall you pick mushrooms as well. Yeah. So, um, so it will be. I think this evening it will be crowded in the woods around our house. It will, yes. So, I have to show you something, Carl. Well, we talked about outhouses and toilets and stuff. Mm -hmm. So you know, I collect these things. Oh, the toilet. Yeah. What you call yeah. that? The little toilet rolls for toilet the paper. Toilet rolls. I think. Sometimes I pick them out of the garbage can because you don't remember I collect them. Mm. I picked up one this oh, morning. Oh, okay. Whoops, sorry. Because I used them for sewing. So I, now I have saw, uh, put the seeds in toilet mm. rolls. And I see that you're planting sweet peas. And it's sweet peas because last year we, we planted a lot of sweet peas, but we, it was quite late. Yeah. So oh, we could hardly pick them. My favorite. They smell because you delicious. Love them, so oh, I adore now them. Now I'm going to sow a lot of these sweet peas for you. And I start mm. early now, so maybe this will be very tall. Yeah, I love cutting them and I love putting them in little vases, like, and, and, and just gathering like a massive bunch and in a small vase. And then the smell is just and amazing. That didn't happen last year. We no. were a little bit too late. We were a little bit too late, which was uh, interesting considering we weren't traveling. But I think we were still in the traveling mind. <laughs> but this year, set. Carlos, you will have so much sweet peas you can fill the house. Because I will. This is just the beginning. I have more. So there will be a jungle mm. inside. Okay? Yeah. Because this, they might be very tall until we get them out. But yeah. the toilet thing is so nice for planting because it's mm. like recycling <gasps> that's good anyway Arne, so, uh, uh, we're back back, back to the mountains <laughs> no. <laughs> we have uh, we've been reading the Fjellvetregler the, the Norwegian, yeah, the Norwegian uh, mountain code rules which are very useful to know uh, if you are planning to spend your Easter in the mountains like many people do and today we have come to rule number six which uh, you should read in Norwegian I think okay. I think I read the last Where's one the, the, the paper. chocolate paper is there so number six Ta trygge veivalg, gjenkjenn skredfarlig terreng og usikker is. Ja, yeah, ok. So, uh, the translation of that is choose safe routes, recognize avalanche terrain and unsafe ice. Very, very important. Very important. Uh, your life will depend on it. We have a lake here. Yeah, we have we, we have to take care of all these things. Yeah, our, yes. Well, avalanche <laughs> here is, uh, I, I think we... The, the biggest probability that will ever be in an avalanche is an avalanche of yarn because the yarn is stacked in a way that one day it will just fall over us and uh, I don't think it'll kill us but it no. will it will traumatize us for sure we had um, one a few days ago yeah we remember did remember you were looking for something and you found this basket and yeah. there was an avalanche of we had yarn. an avalanche of yarn however we do have a big big lake here and uh, that is uh, crucial that we recognize unsafe ice Right now, I have no problems with going on the lake. There's a lot of ice fishermen out there, and the ice fishermen, they drill holes through the ice, and then they can tell us the, the thickness of the ice. 
and currently the ice is six feet yeah. thick, Up two meters. So right now it is very safe. However, um, as we were saying the other day, by June seventeenth, it's uh, it's all gone. Sorry, by May seventeenth, it's all gone. So something happens uh, between, say, early April and 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 uh, the middle of May. So I think that the ice will probably say be safe until the beginning of April. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't go on the ice after April. No. Ten. But if you live further down in the valley, yeah, like then you have to be you really live, careful. If you live close to Mirsa, for example, because I heard on the radio like there's a saying you shouldn't be on the ice after the was it the 18th of March. Yeah. If you live. Yeah, in the valley. In yeah, the valley. in the mountain. In the mountains, we're okay. We have also the possibility to observe the ice from the second floor, and we can see when the ice starts breaking because or or it starts melting because then you'll see these different levels there's going to be like pocket pockets so we know when the ice is no longer safe we can see that so we're okay uh, what happens then is the the ice melts yeah. and and then uh, by may uh, 16th the lake is here which also means spring flooding yeah and and speaking of spring flood i mean this is this is uh, water not only from the lakes that melt, but also uh, it's coming from the mountains and the ice in the mountains that melt. Remember that spring? We had a real spring flood mm. there. Yeah. Because there was some pipes under the road. It was that burst. Yeah. And something or like the water didn't get into the lake. So we were living on an island. Yeah, remember? yeah, we were in a kind of a peninsula, actually. A peninsula. There was like water around the house. Yeah, and usually every year when the ice melts, the lake, the water, uh, the water in the lake does rise, which means that we lose a little bit of our land because it, it goes underwater. Yeah. And speaking of spring flood, Arnaud, yeah. I have hidden a, an egg today. And you know, I, I, this is so hard for me because as soon as I sat down and we start to speak, I saw the egg. Oh. Because, so I know where it is. Okay, so where is it? It's behind you. Yeah, there. but I'm not gonna get it. It's. I can't reach it, and I can't get up because I have a very bad long jump. <laughs> okay, okay, I'll do it. <laughs> but I'll have to do this. I'll have to slide because I also have a really, really ugly. <laughs> okay, there we go. Yeah, I can see your hand, not your trousers. And now I have to squeeze. <laughs> There we go. We don't want to look indecent on I YouTube. I think you should put on some nice trousers. Anyway, here's the egg. So this is, we call this one the spring flood because this is kind of, it's acanthus, but it's also, it could also be like waves. Yeah. Water flooding. Yeah. So and that's the egg of the day. And every year in May, we have spring floods here, not very dramatic, except for one year. But we do hear about it in the, in the news, other yeah. places that are closer to mountains, where, where the, we know the waterfalls are really violent because of the uh, great amount of water that like comes. A lot of houses yeah. are going into the water. And then we That's kind scary. of, uh, yeah, and then we kind of deal with that for a little while, and then summer comes and everything's okay. Yeah. So, Arne. <laughs> that was that was a little bit of uh, the hitte. Uh, hitte. Uh, now people understand a little bit more of the Norwegian uh, mindset. Uh, Norwegians they want to be close to nature, they want to ski, they want to pick berries, and they want to hang out with their families, yeah. close to nature, get away from it all, and and live um, a, a, a rich life in the sense of a life uh, close to the stunning nature yeah. that we have Simple life. in our country. Well. Wow. So. Unless you have that very elaborate and yeah. high-end cabin, then it's a luxury life. Yeah. Anyway, it's been lovely <laughs> t telling you a little bit about this. Uh, we are getting closer to, to Easter, so for the next uh, three episodes, we are going to kind of sum up the whole Easter, uh, the Norwegian Easter uh, experience for yeah. you to um, uh, you know, enjoy. And I, we can promise you it's very, very different from anything you've ever heard from any other culture. I can guarantee that. Mm. So Arne, 
Yes. Uh, we have a big competition going on. We have a and, competition. And we're loving seeing we, all the beautiful yeah. things that are being posted. So if you make the eggs from the knit along, you should post them on Instagram or Facebook and hashtag Arne Carlos sit and knit for a bit or yes. one of them. And both. then both. And then you will be in the competition. And the prize is a surprise. A surprise. And the more we tag, <laughs> the more you tag uh, or the more images you post tag the more entries you get, uh, the winner will be selected randomly and we are actually uh, going to do that on the 31st of March when we will announce the winner. Yeah. And, uh, and yeah, the more you enter, the more prob probability it is for you to be able to win. It's like a lottery, yeah. pretty much. Okay, Arne, formalities? Uh, please subscribe and put on your notification and engage. Yeah, and with engage we mean give us a big like for the episode, comment. comment, and just engage with us in general. That really is something we appreciate. Yeah. And I think you have to be better on hiding eggs. Oh, yeah, but tomorrow is your turn. And then you, you have one more to hide. Yeah, and I have two. Well, but because I've been so bad, maybe you let me hide two. I think you should hide two and I should hide one. Yeah, you'll give me a, a, two, two more chances to do a better I, job. I think you have to try to do a better job because... Okay, I will. <laughs> <laughs> I'll do my very best, I promise. Tomorrow yeah. I'll try again. And I wonder, Carl, do we have more of those ice boxes? Empty ice, ice boxes? Ice cream boxes? Ice cream boxes? Because uh, not unless we buy ice cream. So we have to buy ice cream because... Yeah. I have to plant more of the peas. Yeah, but we won't go today. Uh, we'll go tomorrow no, morning tomorrow before morning. Uh, the second wave of uh, people come up. Yeah. Okay, everybody. We look forward to seeing you again tomorrow. Thank you so much for watching. And uh, we hope you've been enjoying this podcast together with us. We are certainly enjoying doing this for you. Okay? See you tomorrow. See you tomorrow. Bye. Bye.